Like, <laughs> feel a little sparse, you know. Wonder if there's anybody following us in this room. So, I don't know. Push this. Not to hear us. Oh. Such a big focus at this meeting, but it's
going to go ahead and get started. This is a oral presentation seven. Um, and I'm Aaron Baker. This is Chris Sonaday, and we're your moderators for this discussion. So we're really excited to hear uh, the presentations this morning. So we will go ahead and get started. Our first presentation is uh, Canadian Coaching Program Leads to Successful Transition from Open to Laparoscopic HPV Surgery. And so we'll welcome uh, Dr. Alice Zhu. Then, oh, sorry. Thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to present. And these are our disclosures. So laparoscopic techniques for HPV surgery emerged as early as the 1990s. Um, however, currently um, laparoscopic approaches uh, for minor liver resections and distal pancreatectomies have been seen as safe and effective and compared to open has several benefits, including less blood loss, shorter hospital stays and less preoperative complications. However, compared to the other fields of surgery, the laparoscopic approaches for HPV uptake has been relatively slow. Um, a survey of 68 Canadian surgeons in 2017, which represented some percent of the of techniques, certain areas are difficult, including um, lack of experience and adequate training. We had an opportunity to with the laparoscopic instruments and to practice on live animal models. Finally, the coach will visit each institution um, and hear the participant surgeons who have visited the institution for real time people. I was going to each center. So, in the sessions, um, what practice was there arranged by having the kind of communication I was. Instructed interviews of challenges with the upper back of the HPV procedures, um, the influence of coaching on their practice, the experience of the program. The purpose of the participants of centuries of something called the coronavirus. Um, we were able to successfully interview seven of the institutes. Um, of course, they all had HPV training. Three of them had a university affiliated and six of them were academic. So for several questions, for as well, students for the life groups um, have been an extremely important um, and, and it was seen as I 
teams came up that the procedures are technically challenging and with high risk of bleeding and potential for major complications was identified as a very good. Um, and all of these kinds of aspects of MIS training. That they did not receive any laparoscopic training during their fellowship. And finally, time, um, learning curves, and already busy clinical practice with long and limited work is certainly not easy when you want to incorporate a new new skill. So how did the experience of program? Our surgeons had a positive experience stating that the um, program was motivating, interactive, valuable, and fun. And fun. With respect to pancreas resections, when asked to provide an estimate of the proportion of pancreas resections done laparoscopically before and after the coaching session, there was a surgeon reported estimate of 56% increase, with biocenters stating that laparoscopic distal pancreatectomies became the standard of care. With respect to liver resections, not as big of an effect. However, we did see that the surgeons reported an average of 17% increase in the use of laparoscopy. Several strengths in our model, um, including the hands-on experience, the institutional visits, maintaining collegiality and a non-judgmental relationship was very key, um, and enthusiasm from both the coach and coachee. Opportunities for improvement included further, more institutional visits. The work that we have done. and all the excitement about robotics nowadays. I think there's a lot of lessons here that can be transitioned. But to conclude, um, we present a unique opportunity, a unique program um, in that coaching uh, provides an opportunity for professional development um, in a rapidly evolving field. Expanding coaching initiatives in this context is key in the broader effort to allow successful integration of new techniques in HPV surgery. Thank you for your attention. We'd like to thank Ethicon Canada, who funded the coaching program, and Dr. Sean Clary, who acted as a skills coach. Our discussant for this presentation is Dr. Stephen Hughes. Good morning. I guess it's almost afternoon. Is this on? Can you hear me? All right, I can speak loud. <laughs> Alice, well done. I mean, congratulations. This is a ton of work, and it's really important work. Um, uh, this notion of coaching is really important, and I, I have two questions for you. One is you must have encountered significant barriers. I, I was glad to see in your final slide, I finally understand how you paid for it. <laughs> um, but uh, credentialing is a huge issue, and obviously I think it's a key component. I've been lucky enough to have folks come watch me operate uh, to pick up things, but to allow them to actually get their hands dirty is, is it can't happen. So I'd be curious, at least in America, that's a that just getting them into the OR is a challenge. I can't imagine the barriers that you encountered uh, for the visiting surgeons to actually get their hands in on the case or for Dr. Cleary to actually go to their institution and, and actively participate in those operations. So that'd be one question. Um, how, how do we overcome those? And then the second question I have is that, um, like you said, these are subjective recalls of the participating physicians. Do you have plans to actually objectively take a look at how this really did impact, you know, 
true data and, and, and how did it transform the practice in these uh, institutions that embarked on the coaching. Um, but very well presented. Congratulations. I think uh, it's hard to talk about how much work really went into it just came out in eight minutes. So congrats to you and your, your, your mentors and all that work. Thank you, Dr. Hooks. Um, to answer your first question, I was I myself was not involved in the planning, but I do know that a lot of planning had to be done preemptively in order to set these sessions up. Um, and it wasn't easy. I think you need REB, you need the patient's consent. All of that has to be agreed upon before actually going to a center. Um, and I wasn't involved in that process, but I can link you up with Dr. Jayarama who can answer that question. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I truthfully, I don't know the answer to that question. I know that in Toronto, some of our hospitals, although they're not, uh, they're different hospitals, they work under one big umbrella. Um, and typically surgeons who work under that umbrella will go between hospitals. Um, but to expand it into a different province, into a different country, I think that is very challenging. And I don't know the barriers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, there's, and I can answer this with part of the first question, um, to get data from each of these sites, it's, it's not easy. It's a different REB process. It takes months to look into. Um, and I think there's a lot of confounding factors on you know, how coach, I mean, I think coaching has a role, but I think there's other, um, there's other factors that's also helped transition. Um, and truthfully, you know, this project wasn't really to put a number on how much it changed our practice, but simply to say that it has a role in helping these surgeons uh, feel more comfortable with their skills to provide them with the new set of skills. And I think our numbers are, you know, subjective. However, they, they're reflective. They're reflective of the surgeon's confidence. They're reflective of the way, you know, that um, they perceive themselves. You know, they now perceive themselves as being able to do a distal pancreas laparoscopically without any hesitation. So I think that is what um, those numbers are, are meaningful in that sense. A hundred percent. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask one quick question? Absolutely. There is, I mean, as you know, I'm sure there. There are there is some literature now about mm -hmm. surgical coaching. Caprice Greenberg, probably the most mm -hmm. um, prolific of that. And there does seem to be a need for some longitudinal or yeah. ongoing or checkpoints or proctoring or something. Have you has that been discussed? You might have to get Sean out of Minnesota, but um, but I, I, I you know is there a longitudinal aspect to this program? So this program, what um, the study period was long period and the the coaches and the coaches they they stayed in touch for years and there it wasn't because of all the challenges that they had in terms of setting it up um completing the actual program took months um and they had multiple visits multiple you know video visits um but we agree longitudinal mentorship longitudinal coaching is really key here it's hard to go to a weekend course you're learning something but then taking that back to your practice to your own patients i don't know if how many people will be comfortable with the weekend course although great things that weekend courses but Awesome. Well, thank you thank so you. much. Great presentation. All right. Our next presenter is Dr. Davidson from Washington University in St. Louis uh, about the importance of robotic surgery training and HPB fellowship. This is based on a, a, a HPBA fellow survey. So welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, first, just wanted to thank the HPBA for the opportunity to present this, as well as uh, my mentors, collaborators, and Dr. Shen for being the discussant. <sighs> 
Um, so no disclosures to report. Um, so, you know, the, the adoption of robotics to HPV surgery um, has been a little bit more gradual than others, especially is just due to the kind of complexity and the steeper learning curves associated with HPV surgery. Um, as we all know, the benefits of robotics are numerous for the surgeon, you know, 3D visualization, dexterity, ergonomics. But even more recently, there's been clinical data to suggest that there's superior outcomes for the patients as well in certain uh, certain scenarios. Um, but despite sort of the benefit of, to patients and to uh, the surgeon, um, what's been kind of described is that the training in HPVA approved fellowships has been uh, heterogeneous and program dependent. And so the, the sort of the objective of this study was to define fellows' expectations for their robotics training, as well as their the perceptions of the utility of the surgical robot. And this is for fellows that started August 1st of 2022. So this work is built off of important prior work from the CMC group, Dr. Baker, actually as well, Dr. Iannitti. Um, so they did a similar survey in 2018 to fellows' perspectives of HPV programs in North America, um, so, and actually had a few questions about robotics training. And what they did find is that there are perceived deficits from training and robotics training in 2018, uh, even then. Um, and more interestingly, on the, in the pie graph on the right, uh, only 22% of fellows felt that they had structured access to robotics training. So the vast majority felt that either they had no access or that it was they did have access, but it was unstructured. Um, Dr. Jay Raja's group uh, in Texas also published a study about expectations of fellows um, in HPV surgery and asked uh, a few questions about robotics. Um, and they found when they asked them specifically what they thought about the importance of robotics uh, to their fellowship, most said it was important, but there was a significant population of fellows that said it doesn't really affect their career. Um, so I would just kind of take note of that compared to what we found in our study. Um, also at that time, they found that a little less than 50% of trainees would come out of fellowship with no robotics training at all. Um, and then more recently in 2022, the SWAT task force published uh, these data about um, fellows assessments of the strengths and weaknesses of their programs. Um, specifically, they asked questions about robotics, how they felt, how comfortable they felt coming out of training, as well as what they wanted exposure to. It's a little hard to see, but the white bar graph on the left, screen left, um, describes the percent of fellows that felt practice ready for certain procedures. So this includes not only major hepatectomies and whipples, but also sort of the lower complexity HPV surgeries like distal pancreatectomies and segmental liver resections. So very few fellows felt practice ready. Um, despite that, fellows wanted more exposure to robotics universally for all these procedures. And so, um, you know, the objectives of our study were to kind of build off of those prior studies and characterize current fellow sentiment towards robotics in HPV surgery um, and robotics with training within their current programs. Um, we were hoping with, with this survey, we could determine key factors that define the fellowship experience and then uh, identify potential gaps where it could be improved. So this is the study design. We um, uh, submitted a, a survey, 23 question survey to fellows, had about a 67% response rate. It was anonymous and cross-sectional, performing about a month into fellowship. Um, methods, we used descriptive statistics to characterize our question responses and then correlations, which I'll show toward the end. So just to jump into the data, um, as expected, sort of demographics, the majority of fellows uh, are in the HPV training pathway, 25% uh, in the surgeon pathway and a handful in the transplant pathway. Um, what I found very interesting is that, you know, prior robotic experience was heterogeneous across the group. So there's some, some fellows are coming in, you know, quarter of fellows are coming in with no prior rob robotics experience, while some, some are coming in with extensive robotics experience, so more than 40 cases in residency. Um, as far as how fellows felt about the importance of robotics training and fellowship um, compared to prior studies, almost all felt it was essential or important. So the majority said it was essential. And then as far as uh, how they considered robotics training for their career, they also majority said that what it was essential. And this is in contrast to prior studies where it was a little bit more mixed. Um, Trainees also, the, the fellows th felt that uh, fellowship, um, their choice of fellowship was influenced by the offering of robotics training. And then um, kind of across the board, 81% of the fellows thought that uh, robotics training was important for job prospects and marketability. Um, of those fellows that responded to the survey, not all were actually offered robotics in their training. So um, compared to Dr. Jayaraja's study, where it was kind of 50-50, um, now about 86% of fellows are being offered robotics training. And despite that, um, they're a little bit uh, still um, 
uh, undecided on whether it is uh, they're satisfied with their training thus far. So 44% are kind of neutral in that in that neutral category. There certainly are about a quarter of, of fellows that um, do feel uh, you know satisfied with their training thus far, but a significant portion are also unsatisfied. Um, and we kind of explored reasons for that. Um, and one is, I think that um, this is actually the anticipated percent of total cases performed robotically by fellows. Um, and it actually seems to be less than 25%. So the majority uh, of cases will be either performed in fellowship, either laparoscopically or, or um, open. Um, and then total number of cases, robotic cases that are being performed are less than 100. Now, this is one element of the sort of um, robotics training um, uh, one one aspect of ro robotics training that I don't think has been really touched on much in the literature, and that's the amount of time the fellow is in the bedside assisting role, and then also the presence of a dedicated uh, RNFA or robot for surgical first assist. And as you can see, the amount of time a fellow is going to be anticipating being in that bedsiding role is pretty heterogeneous. There's some programs where actually fellows, you know, 10% of fellows believe that they're going to be in that bedsiding role over 50% of the time for the entirety of their fellowship. Um, and then on, on top of that, 42% uh, um, of fellows don't ever interact with a, a dedicated first assist in the OR. So either it's going to be a fellow, a resident, or an intern bedsiding. Um, we asked, also asked fellows what their anticipated comfort level would be with lower complexity HPV cases, so you know, distal pancreatectomies, minor hepatectomies, and most agree that they would be comfortable coming out of training with, with uh, that skill set. While most uh, did not agree that they would be comfortable coming out of training doing sort of, uh, you know, major hepatectomies or, um, you know, whipples. Um, building off of also prior the prior prior research kind of defining what expectations were coming into fellowship versus the reality of fellowship. Um, that was also pretty heterogeneous. Uh, you know, some fellows, their expectations were met. Um, some were uh, a bit disappointed and some were um, uh, surprised. Um, and significant portion were also still kind of undecided about that. Um, we took it one step further and asked about fellow satisfaction with autonomy on the console, and that also was heterogeneous. So um, fellows are kind of across the board. Um, some were satisfied, some were not. Um, to kind of identify the gaps that could be, uh, you know, actionable gaps in robotics training that could improve uh, the fellowship experience, we asked about what what they would want to see more of in their training. And um, of course, across the board, everyone or a majority said autonomy and console time. Um, but also, you know, a significant portion, 60% of, of fellows wanted uh, a formal robotics curriculum. And that's in contrast to the graph on the right, where only 70, or excuse me, 26% are offered robotics curriculum. So there's a pretty big discordance between uh, what fellows want in terms of a curriculum and then what they're actually offered. So um, to kind of summarize all that data, I know it's a lot of a lot of questions kind of um, uh, characterized there, but to kind of summarize it, we actually did correlations between fellow overall fellow satisfaction with their robotics training and some of those various elements that we just went through. And not surprisingly, the things that are correlated with overall fellow satisfaction are going to be the number and percent of robot cases. I mean, everyone wants to operate more on the robot. Um, they also want to, you know, want to have autonomy on the console. That's not surprising either. But I think what is important to note is that fellow satisfaction was significantly correlated with the presence of a robotics curriculum. Um, as well as uh, negatively correlated with the fellow as a bedside assist. So the more time you end up spending uh, on the bed in the bedside assisting role uh, kind of correlates with lower satisfaction scores. What I didn't show, um, though, is that fellows, uh, when asked if they should spend some time in the bedside role before moving to the console, almost nearly 90% of the fellows agreed with that statement. Um, and then, uh, again, one more step further, asking about what potentially correlates with fellow satisfaction with their autonomy. Um, we did find a significant correlation between expectations and their satisfaction with their autonomy. So that kind of implies that the fellow's expectations coming into fellowship is really defined by their autonomy, how much autonomy they're granted early on. Um, but you can imagine a scenario where their expectations coming in is, is, uh, defines their autonomy. Um, but, you know, people are coming in with different levels of robot experience. So let's say you have a fellow that's coming in with extensive robot experience, they would uh, potentially have uh, expectations of more autonomy, while those that aren't would have uh, expectations of less autonomy. So we wanted to control for that. After controlling for pr prior robotics experience, um, satisfaction with autonomy and expectations actually were still significantly correlated. 
Um, in addition, uh, we also found a significant correlation with autonomy and uh, the, the percent cases that we had a dedicated RNFA or dedicated versus cyst, which suggests that fellows are more satisfied with their aut autonomy when they have that, that RNFA and that bedside assisting role helping them. Um, and then finally, of course, we, as we'd expect, the more cases uh, fellows are kind of put in that bedside assisting role, the less, less uh, satisfaction that they seem to have. So the real question is, you know, what are actionable things that we can do um, to sort of structure uh, robotic training curriculum uh, kind of universally across the board for HPVA uh, fellowships? And so this is sort of a concept roadmap of what, what can be done, uh, particularly for fellows that come in with no robotics training at all. Um, and so for, you know, the first one to three months, you would have the, the fellows sort of focusing on simulation. So robotic simulation, sitting at the robotics uh, virtual uh, console doing drills. Those drills are actually scored, so you could um, develop a, a curriculum where the, you have a scoring threshold that you have to beat to, to move on. Um, Intuitive actually offers excellent online training modules as well as sort of didactics um, that, sh that should and could be uh, completed before getting onto the, the you know, console in the OR. And, uh, you know, our program, we require fellows to, to perform a certain amount of bedside assisting cases, at least 10. And so I think that's absolutely uh, critical in the first uh, you know, month or two coming into fellowship. And then in the middle of uh, fellowship, we'd see um, sort of a transition to um, graded autonomy on the console. So in that dual console role with the, the attending, you would have them give you more sort of more active control time of the, the robot. And that actually can be measured by the robotic console itself. So you can see an increase in active control time in, uh, on the fellowship fellow side. Um, and then finally, after uh, that uh, sort of 12 to 15 month period toward the end of fellowship, you would be expecting to have that proficiency, that independence and in lower complexity cases for fellows um, and see more of the uh, the attending serving as like a in that proctoring role just in, uh, while they let the fellows um, gain their independence. So in conclusion, you know, there is a discordance between uh, how fellows perceive robotics are important to their fellowship and to their career and also uh, their satisfaction level with training at their program. Um, fellows' expectations do correlate with their autonomy, um, and this is irrespective of prior robotics experience. Um, fellow satisfaction also, uh, uh, the correlates of fellow satisfaction demonstrate the value of dedicated bedside assist, so the RNFA role. Um, and then most fellows seem to want access to a structured robotics curriculum. And in my opinion, I think this is the fastest on-ramp to autonomy, especially for fellows with no prior robotics experience. So yeah, happy to take any questions. This will be discussed by uh, Dr. Shen. I'd like to, uh, well, I'd like to thank the HPBA for the opportunity to discuss this paper and for Dr. Davidson for giving me the manuscript well ahead of time. Well, there's no question, there's a lot of interest in the robotic MIS platform for HPB surgery, as seen by the programs here at this meeting um, in the literature. But um, Dr. Davidson's study clearly shows there's a lot of, um, it's not a uniform experience you know, for incoming fellows. And I have, uh, I have one comment and then one question for Dr. Davidson. And this survey is taken from the fellows as they're starting their fellowship and, and what their perceptions are about H robotic training and their initial experience with uh, the training of that fellowship. And I would suggest uh, doing a follow-up survey of these same fellows at the end of their fellowship to maybe get a more accurate assessment of you know, what their actual experience was and what those true gaps are uh, to kind of flesh out the initial data you presented. Absolutely. Uh, the question I had was uh, question number nine in your survey. There was one you didn't mention about what the fellows, at least their perception of at that training program they're at, how many, what percent of their of the cases were done robotically. So maybe some idea of the volume at that program. And I wondered, did you see any correlation between that question or the volume with some other questions regarding uh, their satisfaction? with uh, the program or the amount of autonomy they got, or even in terms of how expectations met reality uh, or where they thought that training program could improve, you know, their robotic surgery curriculum uh, or what aspects of robotic surgery curriculum that they would like to see at the program. So did you see any correlation between 
the volume of the program and some of those other factors. Thanks again yeah. for the afternoon discuss your paper. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, no, I 100% I agree. Uh, you know, this is sort of um, a study of what fellows anticipate in their fellowship, and and certainly a follow-up study would be, I think, would really um, kind of flesh out this entire concept to see if the expectations and anticipated, um, you know, their anticipation of their fellowship actually bore out. And so we have been talking about that, actually following that up later um, with this uh, this fellow group. Um, and as far as the, the correlation, so in, in terms of overall fellow satisfaction, so, you know, definitely percent cases, number of robotic cases are certainly correlated strongly um, with overall fellow satisfaction. But um, I think the action, because that's a little bit hard for, you know, to think conceptually about how do we increase the number of cases, how do we increase the percent of cases that we're doing on the robot, because it's, you know, it's you're attending this book in these cases, right? So it's based on their comfort level. But I think what is actionable and what, what we can do is from a fellow fellow side is push for that structured curriculum where when we show up to the OR, we're not sort of tying a knot for the first time on the robot while our attending is you know watching us do it. It's, it's something where you go into the lab and you build your foundation. You spend a lot of time in the simulator, you spend a lot of time in a wet lab. And then when, only then do you come to the, the console and actually um, um, do these operations. Um, so I think that from, from a fellow perspective, the actual item is kind of, uh, coming to the OR with, um, with that skill set, And then, cause, cause then you'll learn the operation once you know how to use the robot. That's what I would say. That's great. The interest of time. We'll keep going, but that was a great, uh, presentation and discussion. Next, we will welcome Dr. Angela Hill, who will be uh, uh, presenting cross-fellowship inter-institutional inter exchange, a new paradigm in hepatobiliary surgery training. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, these are our disclosures, not particularly related to our study today. Um, so as we've discussed throughout the conference, um, complex HPV surgery is unique in that there are multiple training pathways. So as discussed before, the HPBA offers the HPB fellowship. Um, the SSO offers the Complex General Surgical Oncology Fellowship, or CGSO, and um, ASTS offers the Transplant Fellowship, um, through which you can also do a Transplant HPB Fellowship. Um, although there's increased interest in standardizing these fellowships, um, as discussed, um, these fellowships continue to have different clinical as well as technical foci, which I will um, address in turn. So starting with the HPB Fellowship, so this is accredited through the Fellowship Council. Um, HPB fellows on average are required to complete 100 major HPB cases over the course of one to two years. Um, this includes at least 25 major hepatectomies, 25 major pancreas resections, as including 20 Whipples, and 15 uh, biliary tract operations. Um, in turn, the CGSO fellowship, kind of as anticipated, focuses more on a multidisciplinary um, oncologic approach. So all fellows are required to complete 240 cases over the course of two years, of which half are required to demonstrate multidisciplinary treatment. Of the 240 cases, at least 35 are required to be within HPV. And finally, um, the transplant accreditation TACC is uh, th through which the ASTS uh, fellowship is accredited. And in total, um, fellows are required to complete uh, 50 uh, solid organ transplants. And then fellows who specifically pursue the transplant HBB track are required to complete uh, 50 HBB cases, of which 15 are hemihepatectomies, 15 must be major pancreas resections, and then 15 must be um, major pancreatic resections. We sought to assess the impact of our inter-institutional um, fellowship exchange um, on, these on these diverse uh, fellowship pathways. So our fellowship exchange is between the Memorial Sloan Kettering um, Cancer Center in New York City and their CGSO program and the Transplant HPB program over at WashU. To give a bit of background, um, this fellowship started back in 2014, the fellowship exchange started back in 2014, actually with two attendings, um, Drs. Magella Do Doyle and Bill Jarnigan, who decided that they wanted to switch spots um, just to get a sense of different uh, institutional experiences. Given the success of their time there, um, this tradition has continued every year um, ever since. Uh, this slide shows a lot of familiar faces. Um, these are the past fellows who have participated thus far. In total, 14 fellows have participated. Um, two of the people on the slide will be participating this upcoming May. 
Um, in general, it's the eight. AHPBA um, fellow from each institution um, who's in their second year who's invited to participate in this exchange. Uh, this exchange was on hold in 2020 and 2021 um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, prior to the fellows arrival at their visiting institution, um, fellows uh, complete their paperwork um, to kind of take care of all the logistical bases and this includes um, licensure um, paperwork as well as electronic health record access. And um, housing is also guaranteed for all fellows throughout um, their time at the other institution um, by uh, housing paid by the hosting institution. In order to examine this experience, um, we utilize both quantitative and qualitative dimensions. So starting with the quantitative dimension, um, we were looking at case logs, both provided by fellows as well as provided by the fellowship council. And then in terms of the qualitative dimension, um, we provided a quick online survey uh, that discussed both the pros and cons essentially of that experience. Um, this was a cross-sectional um, time point. Uh, so we're not really able to compare one-to-one -one the fellows experience. That being said, um, given that we administered at one time point, it does provide an interesting range of experiences from fellows who have just graduated to fellows almost 10 years into their attending experience. So starting with the quantitative dimension, um, this demonstrates the median number of cases that fellows completed in their one month at the other institution. So starting with the experience of transplant HPB fellows at MSK, um, they completed a median of 24 major cases, of which six were major pancreas resections, um, three major hepatectomies, four hepatic artery infusion pump insertions, and one major biliary operation. Um, looking at the transplant HPV cases performed by the MSK fellows, they completed a median of 21 cases, of which um, seven were liver transplants, two were pancreatic resections, two were major hepatectomies, and two were major biliary operations. Um, the other categories meant to address cases, um, for example, like ablations at MSK and living donor nephrectomies um, at WashU. Of note, the WashU numbers do not include, for the most part, deceased donor procurements, just because those weren't as as counted as religiously. Um, these numbers uh, represent typical caseloads um, at each uh, fellow's native institution, given the fact that fellows function um, essentially as native fellows um, starting on arrival. Looking from the qualitative dimension, um, we essentially divided our analysis into two parts. So one was focused on the inter-fellowship dimension and the other was looking at the inter-institutional aspect. So starting with um, the inter-fellowship dimension, um, the two primary things that fellows highlighted in their open-ended responses were one, the benefits of um, receiving different technical training. So for example, CGSO fellows mentioned that they appreciated um, the ability to do the transplant hepatectomies, working in hostile portas, um, also doing their own vascular anastomoses with one um, fellow saying that as an attending, he now performs his own vascular reconstruction. Um, fellows also appreciated having um, the multidisciplinary approach, namely um, transplant surgeons thinking as surgical oncologists, surgical oncologists thinking as transplant surgeons. Um, one example being here, a CGSO fellow saying that um, they better understood how to implement transplant into their current everyday practice. And then looking at the interinstitutional aspect, um, there are a number of things that fellows appreciated about the experience. So one was just a diversity of clinical approaches. So using different institutional treatment paradigms for the same pathologies. Another was the differences in didactics. Um, so for example, MSK uh, utilizes the apprenticeship model, which um, transplant fellows noted was particularly useful in order to understand kind of the everyday life of an attending. Um, the other aspect finally was the network building. Um, of course, this offers a really unique opportunity for second year fellows to kind of build and develop their professional network. Um, of the 13 respondents who participated in the survey, um, 12 said that they would repeat the experience with one citing that um, there was a lack of cultural fit. Um, when asked for you know, what we could do differently moving forward, um, four actually asked for a, a prolonged exchange, um, some more time away from their institution. Um, several asked for increased peer mentorship. Um, some reported that there were fewer cases than anticipated. And finally, there was some frustration with the logistics of call um, at the other institution. Ultimately, we hope that um, this interinstitutional interfellowship exchange um, serves as a paradigm for other uh, institutions interested in kind of broadening the experiences of their fellows. 
The interfellowship dimension offers unique technical and clinical experiences as discussed. And finally, although definitely the interinstitutional aspect is more challenging than the intra-institutional aspect, it does offer exposure to um, different institutional paradigms and furthermore significantly increases um, mentoring and networking opportunities. Thank you. Our discussant uh, is Dr. Alexander Parikh. Thank you. Uh, very well presented. Congratulations, Dr. Hill. And also as uh, someone who knows and colleagues with many of the fellows that have uh, rotated both at WashU and Memorial, congratulations to you. Congratulations, Dr. Doyle, who our president, who uh, one of the pioneers for, for, I think, which is a very unique exchange. So a no. couple of questions. Number one, and you, and thank you also for the manuscript. Like I mentioned, this may have been the earliest I've ever received the manuscript for a <laughs> discussion, and that's great. So you mentioned, you know, the limitations, obviously, with only 14, and it's a single time point. Did you notice any difference in terms of how the qualitative answers in terms of fellows that may have rotated and now are fifth, five, six, seven, ten 10 years, as you mentioned, their attending versus ones that are early? Did the value stay or did they look back on that fellowship and, and make an impact on their career? Number two, as you mentioned, the median caseload, 21 to 24, but as, as the manuscript, it ranged anywhere from five to eight, all the way up to 30. You know, and one would argue certainly if, and I think a couple of the fellows had mentioned, maybe the caseload wasn't as good. Is there changes being made? Because obviously going and doing five cases, questionable value, obviously doing 25, 30, much higher value. And then finally for everyone else, and, and you applied this, is and this is a, a kind of a hard question, um, what, is this possible? I mean, what would advice would you give for other institutions? Because I think that, you know, this is such a unique program. It would be great to expand to other surgical oncology programs, transplant programs, et cetera, uh, both intra and interinstitutional. But thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so addressing, sorry, the first question, I, know. <laughs> no, I should have written these down. In terms of differences. Oh, in values. Far, right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a great question. So we purposefully um, kept the uh, the questions anonymous. And so unfortunately, I'm not really able to say kind of, you know, who's 10 years out from practice versus fresh out. What was kind of interesting is even looking over the answers, I was trying to see like, oh, you know, some people who might mentioning mention their attending experience more frequently. And that really didn't come through, which to me just suggested that the value of the experience was both immediate and long term. Um, and then the few reflections are very specific about current practice, I think just kind of reinforced that these that what they experienced during that one month was able to carry on like two years um, after their fellowship experience. And two, what you asked about the median case number is a fantastic question. Um, so I think in general, um, the case numbers are a bit tricky. I think that's slightly easier coming from MSK and having the fellowship council to kind of give those numbers for us. Um, in terms of the transplant experience, just because I think there's some differences in terms of um, recording, for example, um, things like, um, like I mentioned, living donor nephrectomies or um, the like deceased donor um, multi-organ procurements. Like there are so many additional cases I think that fellows had the opportunities to participate in and um, getting the case logs from uh, previous fellows. Some were very meticulous in recording them, some were less so. Um, and so I'm not sure if those numbers are necessarily as accurate as we'd like them to be. I think maybe measuring them prospectively moving forward would give us a more accurate number. Um, but I do think that, um, with it being May of fellows second year, um, we also had a number of fellows who were interviewing, who were looking for jobs and um, every, like both institutions were very accommodating in terms of allowing them to do so. So the extent to which um, fellows could kind of maximize their caseload also varied. Um, so I think that might contribute to that number, but I do think the fellows who were, um, you know, eager about getting to every case, they were able to complete an incredible number of cases as we saw. Um, and finally, in terms of, you know, actually developing this program, I absolutely agree. Um, this was an incredibly novel and unique opportunity. Um, from what I've learned, you know, going over the data and speaking to Dr. Doyle, and it seems that a lot of it was built on this incredible camaraderie between these two institutions. And having that um, personal relationship and then institutional buy-in really is what translated to not only the fellowship exchange starting, but then continuing over time. Um, so my hope would be that at other institutions, as long as you have that, um, that shared investment 
in um, creating this experience, uh, trialing with an initial fellow, then the longitudinal aspect kind of comes into place over time. Um, and my hope is that, you know, today with the SWAT meeting and um, the increased interest in standardizing um, HPV treatment, that more institutions will have that kind of buy-in. And so we will be able to continue this exchange program in um, multiple settings. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. So the next uh, presentation uh, is by Dr. Ogliati. I hope I pronounced that correctly. On the SEG sub T, we're going to learn what that is, classification of non-anatomical liver resections for HCC. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> now, um, I will present now our latest study on uh, non-anatomical liver resections uh, for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. The authors of this study have uh, no conflict of interest to disclose. Liver resection is considered gold standard for a resectable hepatocellular carcinoma. However, five-year recurrence rates can be as high as 70%. While most of these recurrence events are attributable to cirrhosis and to an ongoing chronic liver disease, local recurrence after resection is still considered an issue. Uh, traditionally, liver resections have been classified as being either anatomical or non-anatomical. Anatomical resections are well standardized and defined as the removal of the whole anatomofunctional unit containing the tumor by ligation at the origin of the glissonian pedicle. Non-anatomical resections are instead based on the nodule itself and the concept of parenchyma sparing. However, they lack, a they lack a precise definition. And in fact, uh, we can often find in literature that many um, resections that do not meet criteria for being anatomical resections are then, just uh, are then consequently classified as being non-anatomical. This creates uh, an issue of uh, extremely heterogeneous reporting of outcomes with uh, five-year uh, recurrence rates uh, uh, reported between 10 and 60 percent, and also five-year survival rates between uh, 35 and almost 90 percent. Despite the theoretical superiority of uh, anatomical resections, non-anatomical resections are still widely adopted, and uh, this creates uh, uh, an issue of uh, uh, the lack of standardization creates an issue, uh, two main issues actually. One is that by applying an unstandardized technique, we risk to obtain poor oncological outcomes. And secondly, uh, we cannot objectively compare the well-standardized anatomical resections with non-anatomical resections. And in fact, we can find countless studies comparing these two techniques, but the outcomes are often uh, uh, conflicting. The results are often conflicting. The aim of this study is to introduce a classification for non-anatomical resections for hepatocellular carcinoma that is based on the glissonian pedicles vascularizing the nodule. This is a single center retrospective study, including all consecutively resected single nodule hepatocellular carcinomas in one institution. We reviewed preoperative and postoperative contrast enhanced imaging and classified these resections as, as being either appropriate or non appropriate. We then compared these two groups for uh, the rates of local recurrence and disease free survival and overall survival. By reviewing preoperative imaging, we classified the nodules as being either segmental, subsegmental, or terminal. As you can see from figure A, <clears throat> We have, in this case, a segmental nodule sub supplied by a um, segmental portal branch going for the fifth liver segment. In figure B, instead, we have a nodule that is supplied by two subsegmental portal branches going for the eighth liver segment. While in figure C, we have a terminal nodule that is only supplied by terminal vessels. Similarly, we defined also the level of vascular section as being either segmental, subsegmental, and again terminal. <clears throat> we named this classification SEG sub T because it is based, as you well understood, on segmental, subsegmental, and terminal glissonian pedicles. We classified as appropriate or SEG sub T in all those resections 
where the level of vascular section was either equal or more proximal than the level of nodule vascularization. In contrast, we classified as being non-appropriate or seg subte out all those resections where the level of vascular section was more distal than the level of nodule vascularization. With these rules in our mind, a segmental nodule will need a, at least a segmental vascular section to be considered appropriate. In case of a subsegmental nodule, we can have instead either a subsegmental section or a segmental vascular section to have an appropriate non anatomical resection. In the case of terminal nodules, instead, all of these resections will be considered appropriate because uh, um, the vascularization is only given by terminal vessels. We included 97 patients in this study, 74 in the appropriate resection group and 23 in the non-appropriate group. These two groups were similar in patients' characteristics and differing only for HBV positivity, laparoscopic approach, and median nodule size. With a median follow-up of uh, 33 months, the rate of local recurrence was significantly lower in the appropriate resection group. It was 20% against 50% of the non-appropriate group. And similarly, also overall recurrence rates and cut edge surface recurrence were lower in the appropriate group. Overall survival was uh, higher in the appropriate resection group, but this, but this uh, difference was not statistically significant. While disease-free survival was 36% in the appropriate group against 11% in the non-appropriate group, and this difference was uh, instead statistically significant. By performing a univariate binary logistic regression, we wanted to understand which variable could be associated and correlating to local recurrence. And we obtained a 4.10 ratio for non-appropriate uh, seg sub resections in uh, comparison to the appropriate group. In conclusion, uh, we can say that uh, non-appropriate resections for uh, according to seg sub classifications have uh, um, uh, a higher local recurrence rate, uh, and uh, they are also associated to a lower disease-free survival when compared to their, um, to the appropriate uh, resection group. And uh, this classification represents uh, an initial uh, effort to standardize non-anatomical resection for hepatocellular carcinoma, and it could be helpful in future studies uh, to more objectively compare uh, these non-anatomical resections with the instead well standardized anatomical one. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I will now be happy to answer to any of your questions. Dr. Michael, did you see this one? Um, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this paper. Um, Dr. Focoliati, congratulations on an excellent presentation. Um, I really enjoyed your manuscripts. And again, thank you for, for sending it to me uh, with plenty of advance. Um, I applaud your group for, um, uh, you know, characterizing non-anatomic resection in a way that's uh, based on the feeding pedicles, uh, in a sense, to be more mindful of anatomy um, and, and maybe in an effort to, uh, to improve outcomes for these patients. Um, I, have, I have two questions. The first one, um, it was a little bit more evident in the manuscript, but the uh, inadequate non-anatomic resection patients, although the numbers are a little bit small, they did have an increased um, incidence of high-risk features, things like satellitosis, um, tumor size being greater, um, you know, vascular invasion. And so I'm curious if the if the inferior outcomes that you saw in your analysis were were based um, or attributed more to biology than they are to inadequate technique. Um, and then the second question um, is, what do you propose uh, any future opportunities to use uh, this nomenclature uh, to, um, to change practice and potentially improve outcomes prospectively? Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Uh, to answer to the first question, I think this study, of course, has uh, some limits. It is a retrospective study, and it does have a small cohort, especially for the non-appropriate group. And um, there were some uh, uh, small, uh, at, at least uh, in this case, non-significant, but differences uh, in uh, biology between the two groups. 
but uh, we could we cannot uh, with such a small cohort we cannot uh, understand if these are uh, actually relevant and uh, i think in fact the second question answers also to the first one because um we have i think a reason a reasonable biological hypothesis that is now supported by low level evidence with this study maybe with a prospective application uh, of these uh, criteria we could in future studies we could maybe understand uh, if uh, the class the classification itself is the reason of uh, these uh, better oncological outcomes in the appropriate group uh, or if this was only due to uh, biological features and i think it is very feasible to apply this classification uh, in uh, clinical practice and uh, in uh, uh, and consequently into a um, prospective study because uh, we can uh, simply study the patient uh, preoperatively with uh, contrast enhanced imaging which is uh, something that is uh, done already by every liver surgery center i suppose and uh, we can then guide the resection uh, uh, intraoperatively with uh, ultrasound now, of course, everyone is going to aim at an appropriate resection, but sometimes this uh, could be not feasible or uh, maybe the patient features could uh, let the surgeon think that it is not, uh, um, it, it is not worth, worth it in that case. But still, it could be useful to know that uh, an, anatomic, uh, an anatomical resection that is considered non-appropriate uh, it could be done uh, and it carries a higher risk of local recurrence uh, and uh, it it's it might be still worth to, to have this resection but we can say this to the patient uh, that uh, we expect uh, a suboptimal uh, outcome just quickly did you compare by chance in your analysis margin the actual margin distance relative to this classification system <laughs> yes actually um the margin distance was uh, not not difference uh, was not different between the two groups uh, there was uh, a slightly higher uh, um, r1 resection uh, in the non appropriate group and i don't know if this is uh, um, we could not understand if this is due to the non appropriate resection itself or if the outcome of the non appropriate resection is related uh, to the margin that was excellent thank you appreciate the presentation. thank you and our last presenter is dr lionel Cohn, who will be presenting robotic pancreatic and liver surgery is being done more frequently are we getting better or bolder <laughs> Well, thank you for, to the EHPB committee for the uh, great opportunity to present uh, our work on the trends in robotic-assisted uh, pancreatic and liver surgery. Are we getting better or bolder? Um, we have no disclosures. So several high-volume EHPB centers have uh, now embraced the robotic platform for complex surgery. Furthermore, the utilization of the robotic platform in EHPB surgery is growing at a rapid pace, both in low- and high-volume centers. These are some of the landmark studies that have uh, been published in the past five years looking at robotic uh, pancreatic odiodenectomy, robotic distal pancreatectomies, and re robotic hepatic resections. And all of these studies uh, appear to demonstrate uh, either an equivalent or improved morbidity uh, compared to alternative uh, surgical approach, open or laparoscopic. However, despite the increasing utilization of uh, robotic surgery, uh, both nationally and internationally, um, the, uh, these studies have not looked at the safety profile of robotic surgery over time. Therefore, uh, we endeavored to determine whether the increased volume uh, of robotic HPV surgery was associated with increased or decreased complexity, morbidity, and mortality over time. In order to do so, we utilized the 2014 to 2020 uh, ACS Nest Group database and uh, divided our database in an early cohort, compared it to a contemporary cohort, and uh, then proceeded with, uh, after adjusting for potential confounder with a propensity score matching one-to-one, -one, look at our different uh, primary and secondary outcomes, with a primary outcome being uh, morbidity. 
We, um, after our patient selection, we ended up with over a thousand robotic Whipple, um, a thousand, uh, two thousand robotic distal pancreatectomies, and a thousand robotic hepatectomies. This is an important slide. Um, we plotted our data over time, and as you can see, uh, both robotic distal pancreatectomies, robotic uh, pancreatic cholecystectomy, and robotic hepatectomy had a significant increase utilization uh, of performance uh, uh, over time. Um, and then, uh, as uh, previously mentioned, we divided our database um, from 2014 to 2017 for the early cohort, and from 2018 to 2020 for our um, contemporary cohort. We then uh, looked at baseline characteristics, starting with uh, the pancreatic surgeries. And we find that the more contemporary cohort was associated with older age, uh, receipt of new adjuvant therapy, and a malignant uh, diagnosis or malignant pathology. Similarly, looking at the liver cohort, um, we find that uh, the more contemporary uh, cohort was uh, associated with uh, receipt of new adjuvant therapy and an elevated INR. Overall, otherwise, the co cohorts over time uh, were fairly similar. We then look at our uh, primary outcome of interest, which was morbidity. Um, after adjusting with our propensity score analysis, um, each row represented a different, different procedure. And you can see that for both pan uh, robotic pancreatic cholecystectomy, distal pancreatectomy, and hepatectomies, the uh, contemporary cohort and early cohort had e equal uh, morbidity. We also looked at mortality, and there were no differences between the two cohorts. Um, we looked at operative time, and there was a uh, significant decrease in operative time for distal pancreatectomy. However, um, the average difference was about eight minutes. So unclear if this was clinically relevant, um, but that was one of the significant findings. We looked at conversion to open, and there were no difference for both robotic Whipple, robotic distal panc, or hepatectomies. And then we looked at length of stay. There was a significant decrease in length of stay for uh, the contemporary cohort compared to the early cohort uh, for all procedures. And this uh, average to about half a day to a full day uh, difference in length of stay. And then finally, we looked at, uh, for the pancreatic procedures, we looked at um, the uh, differences in uh, clinically relevant postoperative pancreatic fistula, uh, and there were no differences. So in conclusion, um, there has been a significant increase in robotic liver and pancreatic surgery in the ACS Nesquip affiliated hospital. Um, contemporary cohort is associated with older age, receipt of neoadjuvant therapy, elevated INO, and malignant pathology. And despite rapid, rapid adoption of robotic surgery and increased patient complexity, the associated overall mobility and mortality has not changed. We do have certain limitations, including the retrospective nature of our database, um, the limited, uh, the fact that we do not have data on individual surgeon experience and long-term survival. Uh, I just want to thank my, my mentors, uh, Dr. Ajimeka, with whom I uh, started working in Chicago and continue to work as his transition to UCSF, and my program director, Dr. Vijay Maker. I'm happy to take any questions. And our discussant is Dr. Warner from Mayo Clinic. Dr. Cohn, thank you so much for the excellent presentation and thank you for sending me your slides and manuscript in advance. Um, so my first question is, did you look at individual surgeon volume and where they are in the learning curve? And then secondly, um, if we're adding more neoadjuvant therapy and a growing body of surgical experience, how do you explain similar complications over time as opposed to decrease, which is what we see in most of the learning curve literature? Um, and then lastly, why 30 day instead of 90 day mortality? Thank you. Thank you. For, uh, complicated morbidity. <laughs> Thank you for all the questions. Um, so for your first question, um, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, I'm blanking on your first question now. <laughs> oh, individual surgeons, sorry, yes. Uh, so unfortunately we could not abstract uh, individual surgeon data um, with our database, um, but it's certainly a very important question um, looking at um, the best question ideally would be to see on a national level how uh, surgeons, whether it's on community base or academic settings, uh, with and without a curriculum, you know, training um, over time, if their uh, perioperative outcomes are improving 
or um, and to what extent at, at after how much volume that will be the ideal uh, question to ask. Unfortunately, we are limited in our database uh, to, to answer that question. There is uh, one study that I would refer to uh, the LELAPS3 uh, study, which is a prospective multi-center trial that looked at individual surgeons' uh, performance uh, in the setting of a curriculum training and does show safety um, and uh, equal kind of uh, mobility um, early and uh, later on in that trial. Um, um, but uh, yes, the, it would be great to be able to do this on a national standpoint. Uh, your, your second question, in terms of the uh, morbidity um, um, uh, seen in our study and why it's not decreasing uh, despite the increased volume, I think there's two uh, 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 parts to this answer. One is that the increased new receipt of neoadjuvant therapy in our case may also be just a reflection of the increased uh, performance of robotic surgery in uh, non-benign disease, as we have seen this in our baseline uh, um, characteristics. Um, but also, I think it's we cannot pass out whether this increased volume is due to increased performance by um, um, junior surgeons or just surgeons that are starting their robotic um, uh, practice versus uh, surgeons who've already had a lot of uh, practice and just keep on, on increasing their volume. So it's hard to see how this increased national volume is uh, being uh, contributed by these two different uh, types of surgeons. Um, and then for the third question, uh, so we the the ACS NAS flip uh, abstracts the perioperative outcome, limits it to 30 days. So we just use that. Just one quick question for you. Yeah. So one of the major findings of your study was in regard to length of stay between yeah. the two cohorts. Do you think it's possible that there's something else that's affecting length of stay? Like for instance, in the in the early cohort, that was really the time when ERAS was really kind of ramping up for HPV surgery. And so that could also have a major impact in regards to length of stay. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you picked up on that. Um, so um, in, we've seen other studies as well that have seen actually improved length of stay also for um, open procedures and laparoscopic uh, procedures. There's one study that directly compared for Whipple uh, specifically, um, length of stay between uh, all three approach, um, and it appeared that the um, uh, robotic approach had a more pronounced improvement over time in terms of length of stay, but I think there are numerous factors of playing it uh, into this result. Thank you. everyone really high quality work and presentations today enjoy the rest of the afternoon it's good it was nice meeting you thanks. working with you thanks so much john yes thanks so much yeah, yeah. 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 okay